Hi guys, welcome back to the second part of the year. We're already on unit six and we're starting with a very easy topic. And I think it's a topic that is of importance to everybody, um, as well as um, I'm pretty sure you have plenty of knowledge on this topic. We're just gonna talk about renewable and non-renewable resources. There's gonna be a lot of um, a lot of information that you already know and um, a few of things, a few things that you need to remember um, in terms of production of energy and all these. So energy is going to be our main topic here. So for 6.1, we're going to have um, just the type of non-renewable versus the type of renewable resources. So uh, characteristics of each. So non-renewable are going to be the ones that are ex that exist in fixed amount and that involve energy transformation. They cannot be easily replaced. They take longer or they cannot be replaced in, you know, in a short amount of time. And renewable are those, that, are those that can be replenished naturally or near at the rate of the consumption. Um, they can be reused as well. So pretty much that's 6.1. Uh, but let's dig a little bit into it. So um, for this one, I would really like that you remember or that you recall information from previous classes in terms of energy. So what is energy? The ability to do work. What types of energy have you heard before? Potential energy, kinetic energy, yes, those are types of mechanical energy. Uh, how does energy transformation occurs? What happens? Do you, get, do you lose energy? And so on. So usually we're going to use energy. Now we can say in general terms because of um, the needs that we have at home. Uh, the type of machines, the type of tools that we used, and because of technology, we have, um, we have, we believed that energy is kind of just something that we are entitled to. Now, uh, most energy comes from the sun. I also want you to think that there are other types of energy as well that we're going to go into detail. We're going to talk about every single type of energy, um, renewable and non-renewable, but those are types of energy um, that somehow are connected to, if you want to call it the beginning or the first type of energy known by humankind, which is solar energy. Uh, we also know what fossil fuels are, which are the main type of energy that we use so far um, to provide us with um, electricity. Uh, and why are they called fossil fuels? What are fossil fuels? They're highly combustible substances, right? And we know that they come from remains of organisms that um, have lived in past geological ages and that have formed for millions and millions of years. So we're not gonna um, leave that last part on the definition of fossil fuels. There is a great amount of energy. Uh, we also know that the earth core also has some, um, or a big um, deposit of energy, if you wanna call it. Uh, we also know because of chemistry that there are um, different amount of energy depending on the type of atoms that we're talking about and the chemical bonds that hold the atoms together, they will also hold a very big amount of chemical energy, which will provide us with something that we know as nuclear power. Okay, so starting with the types of non-renewable energy, again, they are called exhaustible uh, sources of energy or finite sources of energy. They exist in a fixed amount. We don't have an infinite amount of this. You know, you probably have heard that we are running out of, amount of amounts of fossil fuels, such as oil, for example, because the deposits are running out of oil. And then we have a whole little section um, that talks about, or a whole section talk, talking about specifically oil and the formation of oil and all that. Okay, uh, so usually... Uh, the non-renewable energy are going to involve a process of energy transformation. So if we want to um, take any of these types of um, non-renewable energy, oil, coal, or natural gas, or even nuclear energy, which in a way is uh, put here as a non-renewable, and is only going to be referring to, or it's mainly going to be referring to uranium and thorium, um, they are going to require a transformation. They are non-renewable sources, uh, they are found in non-renewable sources, and then there's some kind of device that will extract that energy into a usable form of energy. And then once it is transformed, some of that energy is gonna be discarded to the environment. So you can never have a 100% uh, efficiency on any of these transformation processes. And as you can see, it's a linear process, it's not a cycle. 
therefore you are you can never bring it back that's why it's called a non-renewable now these sources of energy produce a high energy yield which is a good thing for companies and for economy and that's why um, they are primarily used for anything so it's cheap to extract it's cheap to produce so that's why we use them a lot um, so we will use up all the accessible sort of fossil fuels in about decades to centuries so that sounds like a long time but it's really not okay so just to give you an example of um for the for the non-renewable energy if we talked about oil for example the three main countries that have these um these oil reserves would be venezuela saudi arabia and canada and this is the amount of those um of these reserves and how much percent do they represent globally in terms of amount of amount of oil as you can see venezuela is always on the news saudi arabia is always on the news because of um, this important fossil fuel that is provided to other countries especially to um, the united states okay again so this energy is going to require the non-renewable energy is going to require energy transformation but that transformation has changed so in the past the transformation of energy used to be more centralized um, to a specific place and once it was um, kind of um, put together in a specific place in a device in, a, in an area in like an, in a central power center or something um, then it was distributed into the different places now um, and it, uh, we're kind of going towards a clean local power so we are changing that big central area or centralized power into a smaller areas and a larger or wider distribution in terms of energy because what used to happen in the past is that the centralized power um, if something would have or if something went wrong there then th there would be more areas affected and co in comparison to what we have now which is just uh, everything distributed uh, locally and less less interruptions of power if you want to call it like that okay so switching to renewable types of energy there are some renewable types of energy that you would have to know and i'm sure you are familiar with all of this um, they are also called inexhaustible sources of energy they can be replenished naturally or at a rate of human consumption if we really want to let them replace or um, yeah replenished uh, they can be reused um, and this usually happens um, from a source or they occur in a source in the environment and then there are devices that are used to convert that energy into a use of energy or into a form that we can use um, the, the fastest growing form of renewable energy is solar energy it's no wind it's solar um, and there are some statistics here about the, the the energy consumed by sector in the United States so by sector we can see that um, the amounts of energy are mainly for industrial and transportation. Uh, those are gonna be the big areas that will consume most of the energy in the United States. It hasn't changed much, um, but also if we talked about the um, United States residential sector, electricity consumption usually is gonna be the, um, by our main appliances and um, electricity, um, machines or appliances that we need in our houses so you can see also why do we need so much energy and there are some of these appliances that have to be on all day okay so that was um, 6.1 for 6.2 we're gonna talk about little bits of um, the use of the energy resources and how that is not evenly distributed in developed and developing countries um, and then we're gonna see how that is an issue. But I want you to look at this little tiny um, um, video. <laughs> and I want you to pause and please take a look at this and just kind of have a an understanding for the global energy demand. We really need to emphasize that. And I want you to include it on your um, notes. I also, uh, I'm gonna leave a couple of um, I'm gonna leave a couple of dimensional analysis exercises for you to practice, very simple. Um, and I 
I do want to check this time and I'm assuming you're listening to this. So I'm going to check for, um, for answers and some um, work from these, from these exercises. So that would be part of your notes. If you've noticed the formative grade that I give you for the notes would have to include specifically what I'm asking you on the notes. If you want to have exceeding expectation in the formative um, grades. Okay. So go back to energy, just like a little concept map where we are. What is energy? The ability to do work, right? Or to transfer heat as well. Um, we're going to talk about how the energy, how energy has changed uh, when it has been consumed by humans in the past. It is not the same as how we use energy now or how we're going to use it in the future. So in the past, um, energy was consumed uh, mainly because um, it would give us some kind of strength, right? And most of our energy ca came from food. So uh, humans, we could say, um, they would get their energy from food and that was pretty much the known energy that they that they acquire. But then they also um, discover fire. So then they started using energy from wood, but then deforestation happened. So then they had a crisis they started using animal animal power to produce energy and then wind power to produce energy but it, again this this led to different crises and later on in the industrial revolution um that's when coal was used and that was a big change and you know this because of history but then what happened another crisis because we know that we are running out of those uh, fossil fuels that were discovered one at a time so this is where we are, but we have started discovering our renewable sources. So we're hopefully moving into a sustainable future. Now, we also need to take into account two different things that we're going to mention on this, um, on this video. What is the energy return on investment and what are some externalities? Again, we're seeing ex externalities again, and I know you're familiar with this term, so make sure you apply it to this section or this unit. So, um, well, so I'm going to go back to this. Okay. So here, um, we usually, we have switched the types of sources of our energy because of the efficiency, right? So we have changed from coal and firewood to use diesel or gas in cars because of the capability that these energy sources give us to transportation in this case we have energy to mass we have a higher energy to mass ratio and we need a smaller volume um, in this case we don't need to carry a lot of firewood or a lot of coal in order to start our cars um, it starts quickly can be shut off quickly right so we don't now if you tell me well if that is better why don't we use gas for everything because of the high amounts of air pollution that are produced, per joule of energy that are released, because it requires a lot of money to process and refine it and all that. So again, it's a complex topic. So um, there are some units. Here are your favorites. And if you are lost on what I have spoke, spoken so far in terms of energy, what is energy, and what are the types of energy, and what are some units, there is a step-by-step -step video here that um, I think I think that you've seen this guy before. Um, so please, if you could watch that video, if you feel that you can be lost on math, I would really encourage you to go into this video. It's only eight minutes and you can speed it up. And it's a very quick, rem um, like a refresher on what energy involves. But this is what I want you to include in your notes. This dimensional analysis, I really want you to put it in your notes. I want you to show me your work, show me your setup and tell me your answer, okay? So I'm gonna check that um, on Tuesday when we come back so you can show me this in your notes. And one of you will be the lucky one to go to the board and write down the answer and work. So in 2011, we can just show an, an example here. The total world energy consumption was about 5.21, 521 watts, whoa, per year. So this question is asking you how many gigajoules over here, I have a conversion for gigajoules. So how many gigajoules is that per person? This is total world, right? Total world. 
per person every month, okay? So I want you to show me the setup with dimensional analysis, and I want you to assume that we are 7 billion people in the world. Um, and tell me what is your final answer. All of these, you know, quads and BTUs, and if you don't know what a BTU is, if you don't know what a quad is or a gigajoule and an exajoule, I would really encourage you again to go back to this video and that would give you the basics for this dimensional analysis. But I'm assuming that what is energy and the types of energy and the um, prefixes for the international system of units would be something that you would know for energy. I also included here, not related to the dimensional analysis, but another chart, just because I don't want to give you many slides, but on how the energy consumption in the United States have changed from 1776 to 2007. For example, if you look at the yellow one, the biomass uh, is going to be represented by the wood, right? So that wood, we used to use a lot of wood in the past or in past years, there are still countries that depend a lot on this for energy. I will mention that in a moment, but it has switched a lot to now the usage of natural gas and petroleum, for example. So coal as well, right? At some point in the past, it has, um, it was very high um, in demand, but now then it went down and now again, and you have to think on why, for example, right? Why do you think the amount of coal has gone up again? So as industrialization increases, the energy usage increases and the sources of energy change. So if you heard at some point, or if you hear at some point in this unit that, um, you know, listen, such a country is very big in the production of a certain mineral or, or in oil or whatever, that can change. That can change because the sources of energy, the sources of fossil fuels can change as well. Okay, so the uneven distribution in these two types of country, I, I think that you are very familiar with this, but just, um, just to let you know, is very different. So it's not evenly distributed, it's unevenly distributed. And uh, usually, do you remember the country that was one of the top oil producers, it was Venezuela, right? Venezuela is a developing country. Well, countries like the United States, for example, or maybe Russia or other countries that are um, have a lot of technology, what they're gonna do is they're gonna buy that oil from Venezuela and they are gonna transform it and sell it back to them, right? To developing countries. So any type of um, non-renewable resource, which are the main ones right now, are commercial energy sources. And those are the main ones used by uh, developed countries. However, the ones in developing countries are gonna be energy sources that are based for subsistence. So what does subsistence mean? It means that these type of energy sources are gathered by individuals, communities, for just their immediate needs, such as straws and sticks and animal dung. And they will carry those sticks, right, in order to to get home and warm themselves up and cook food, right? And uh, probably cook meat and just maybe even give light to themselves. So electricity would be just um, not there, like non non-existent and light would be just provided by these type of energy sources for subsistence only. Now, there is a list of countries and their total, this is not, this is a list is wrong. There is a list of countries and their total energy consumption per capita. However, that's not the consumption. When you read those kinds of uh, charts, that's not the consumption of how much a user uses the energy in that country, but it shows all the energy that's needed to as input to produce the fuel and electricity for the end users, so as a country, and they kind of like divided per number of people living in that country. So that is known as the total primary energy supply, and that is a term used to indicate the sum of production and imports, subtracting the exports and the storage changes. So the numbers again come from the World Bank um, and the World Development Indicators. Now, there is this example over here, um, so how much energy is used per capita in the different countries, right? So for example, in the States, the energy used is about like 7.032, right? 
So compared to other countries, if you looked at countries like Brazil and Indonesia and India, they're going to have less energy um, use. Okay, so the energy sources and consumption are unevenly distributed. So the industrialized nations used up like about 100 times more energy per person than the developing nations. The U.S. has only 4.4 of the world's population. This is very important, but consumes 19 percent of its energy, 19 percent of the energy produced in the world. Some regions have substantial reserves of oil, natural gas, fossil fuels, right? Wet areas, other, others have very few. Half of the world's problem, uh, reserves of crude oil, like in the Middle East, which are also rich in natural gas, right, um, are going to be, um, are going to have that crude oil. Now, Russia, for example, is the one that holds the most natural gas. The U.S. has the most coal, and Russia and China have the large coal reserves, have very large coal reserves. So this is just some facts. These are just some facts about um, some of the energy sources and how they are not evenly distributed in the, in the world. Okay. Now, another factor, remember energy transformation that I mentioned at the beginning. It is um, that... In energy transformation, you need energy to produce energy. So it takes energy to make energy. There is no free energy. There is energy that's needed to harness, extract, process, deliver energy. So we need that input of energy. You're going to kind of have this kind of investment of energy. And then companies are going to decide, well, if this is the amount of energy that I need, that means this is the amount of money that I need in order to produce this amount of energy. So is it going to be economically something appealing, right? So mining oil sands, for example, require powerful vehicles and machinery roads, pipelines and waste ponds and storage tanks and all of these and every step is going to require energy. Now, what is the net energy? It's going to be the difference between the energy return and the energy invested. Important, right? The net energy is the amount of energy that will happen after I have, um, I have subtracted from the original amount of energy. Now, Important concept over here, the energy return on investment. I want you to memorize this. The energy return on investment is going to be the energy return divided by the energy invested. Okay? So you're going to have a ratio here. Now, the higher the ratio, you need a high ratio. Okay? Because that's good. That means it's profitable, if you want to call it like that. Higher ratios ratios means we receive more energy than we invest. Fossil fuels have historically high energy return on investment. So that's why they are preferred. Okay. Um, they are going to give us more or the higher energy yield. Now, this energy return on investment ratios can change because um, if we have better technology access, then we can extract those fossil fuels easier. Right now, they de they decline when we extract the easiest deposits first. So then we have a problem. So they have changed over time. They are not static, and we can have an example here. For example, the U.S. oil uh, energy return on investment ratios have gone from 31 in the 1950s to 20 to 20 to one in the 70s, from 11 to one. Uh, sorry, in the 70s, 20 to 1, and then today, 11 to 1. Why? Because we have better access to them, and uh, technology improves. But also, we have less amount of oil. Now, this energy return on investment is gonna, is estimates for oil sands are mostly 3 to 1 to 5 to 1. So we got to think about this. Now, the next one is, what is an energy crisis? Very important concept. The energy crisis is the decrease in supply and the increase in price. And over the number of years um, that we have had, we have had um, different energy crises. So one energy crisis, for example, happened in 1973. So around this area over here. So there was a foreign policy. I'm not even gonna try to pronounce this, but let's say it's Yom Kippur War. Um, was funding Israel. And then the OPEC form and the Arab countries, the OPEC is the organization um, that runs the, 
that runs the oil. So the Arab countries put an embargo on the oil, so the price went up from 3 to 12 a barrel. What was the result? Well, um, there was an embargo. The price went up. There were huge lines to get um, oil and all that gas, right? In, in the 1970s, we also have the Iranian Revolution, which happened because of a decree. So in the 1970s, we had a decrease in supply. So there was an increase in price. Again, there was huge lines of pumps. The result, the government said, OK, so if, you know, fossil fuels or oil or gas is expensive, we need to uh, create policies to increase the mileage of cars and different ways to conserve oil. Now, in 2003, it was just different factors, political, economical factors that caused a change in, in price around the globe. Um, now, we had at first, again, we had a development of technology as well. So when that happened, the price dropped. But then there's overpopulation, there's more demand, and there is also we are running out of oil. So if we're running a lot out of oil, then the price of oil is going to go up again. Okay, that's a lot. Okay, so fossil fuels, again, um, and calling natural gas our our fossil fuels over here, right, petroleum and all, they are going to be our main still, they are our main source of energy. And if we looked at overall, the consumption of energy around the world is going to be mostly fossil fuels. However, from the renewable, even though they are renewable, you can see that most of that is coming from traditional biomass. And the traditional biomass, what do you think is coming from? Trees, right? And actually, it's coming from deforestation, which is not as renewable as we wish it to be. So anyway, um, the world energy consumption uh, by sources, right? Another little graph over here, another little representation of the amount of energy um, that we use and what is it coming from. Now, this is in the world. This is in the uh, United States. So look at the amount of fossil fuels that changed from 2013 to 2017 around the world. It went from 78.4 to 85.2. But you tell me, Miss, but there's more renewable resources now. Why do you think this happened? Do you have an answer for this? Okay. Okay. Uh, U.S. energy consumption by energy source in 2018. This is in the United States. Look at the United States over here. So we use mostly natural gas and oil. And we still use some renewable um, sources of energy. But look at the biomass, how much of the biomass use, is used. Now, there's a book that talks about these. Um, it's the book Children of the Sun. I don't know if you ever heard of the book. It's by um, this guy named Crosby. There's a quote that I think is really um, nice for this topic. It says, most of us in the richer societies can only recall times of immediate access to abundant energy. That abundance tempts us, tempts us successfully to believe that having energy flow down the lines from far away and illuminate our rooms when we flip the switch is normal rather than miraculous. When you to think about that quote. Okay, remember the energy return on energy investment or the energy return on investment. What was that equal to? It was equal to the energy acquired divided by the energy consumed. So if we looked at, for example, the energy return on investment in the USA, um, we can look at how that ratio changes. If we talked about, let's say, coal, right? It's about 40 to 1 over here. Uh, let's say wind, right? And let's say, whoa. And let's say, for example, ethanol corn. It's like almost 1 over here, almost 0, right? 1 something. So that ratio needs to be high. Remember that I told you that ratio needs to be high. So which one am I going to prefer to use, the ethanol corn, or am I going to prefer to use wind, or am I going to prefer to use coal, for example? Even though hydro is like, whoa, way over here, there are other factors we're going to discuss on why that is not the one preferred. Okay. 
Let's do a little math, very simple, no calculations needed um, outside your head. So if you obtain 100 joules of coal and it costs five, five joules to extract the coal, then what is the energy return on investment? So you just simply divide 100 joules divided by five and that would give you 20 joules. So that is a 20 joules, okay, coal, that's good, right? That's, that's good enough, it's higher than three. Uh, so a higher number is more efficient and desirable. So anything below three cannot really be considered a viable energy source. How can you calculate the uh, energy return on energy investment for ethanol from corn? Now, looking at this chart, which way, if looking at these different types of energy, which way do you think we're moving and why, right? Now, this um, energy return on investment is going to be based on the valuation. So, for example, if we talked about coal or if we talked about extraction of oil or fossil fuels, are we really talking about um, the effect that this extraction has in the environment? Are we talking about, can we put a price on that, right? So those are the environmental economics, right? So we want to eliminate energy crisis in a sustainable way. Well, is that easy to accomplish? Is it possible? I want you to look up this video over here that is a YouTube video. Please take a look at that one. Again, it's a very short one. You can totally watch it and take a look at this. Okay, patterns of energy use. Um, it has changed over time. It's going to continue changing, right, because of um, different events, because of economic uh, situations and political situations that we have. So we have not always depend on oil. We used to... We used to um, use wood right at some point we use a lot of coal um maybe now we're using natural gas more natural gas right that's like the main thing in the united states so again it's not all uh very um it's, it's not it's, it's not not stable but it's not it doesn't stay the same necessarily it can fluctuate depending on the necessity so for example when the arab countries created this kind of um, this kind of uh, organization it was like a cartel actually and um, you can read a lot about this but uh, when these setup countries created that um, the United States created the solution for that right they created fracking so then that kind of didn't work for the Arab countries anyway okay so the US energy used one more time right in residential areas how do we use energy right these buildings these involve buildings this um, gray line and then inside buildings we have residential buildings and the type of uh, energy use over here and then the commercial the commercial areas and their type of um, energy use over here so take a look at electronics take a look at computers three percent four percent that's a lot of um the computers they are separated from electronics and they are a very high percentage of the energy used. Okay, 6.3, fuel types and uses. We're gonna talk about wood and peat and the three types of coal. Again, we're gonna talk about coal again later and all the fossil fuels later, but we're just gonna introduce them over here. Okay, and what is coal generation? That's important. Okay, so case study. Um, you probably heard this before. Um, it's connected to the um to the uh aquifer is connected to the aquifer that we talked in the past the ogallala aquifer in the united states so if you have not heard of these i would really this is i made kind of like a summary here for you to kind of maybe refresh your mind on the alberta oil sands and the keystone xl pipeline so if you could please take a look at this case study or just Google it and take a quick look. You would probably remember from the news. Okay, um, so wood, again, used in the past a lot, firewood and charcoal. Charcoal different than coal, please do not mix them. They are not the same. Um, so wood was often used in developing, and is still used in developing countries due to easily um, accessibility. P 
peat. What is peat? It's partially decomposed organic material that can be burned for fuel. Has a lot of moisture, right? So um, we use peat as a base for the formation of coal. Again, coal is different than charcoal, okay? So uh, peat, not coal, right? Is partially decayed plant matter that lives in swamps and bogs they, it, there is low heat content on peat. There is a lot of moisture. What else? We have the next type of, right? So we have lignite and on the content, you do need to know these one by one. So make sure you know the names. Lignite or brown coal, low heat content, low sulfur, limited supplies, bituminous coal. It's gonna be extensively used, prefer high heat content, large supplies, high sulfur content. An anthracite is hard coal, highly desirable, right? There's low moisture. There is heat and a lot of carbon content on that one. So it is desirable because of the heat content, because there's low sulfur, but there's limited supplies of anthracite. How are these formed? Because of variation in heat, pressure, and the depth of burial. Okay, what else? Natural gas. Most of the natural gas is methane. Um, mainly used in the United States, tar sands, they exist in Australia and Canada, uh, a couple of places where they are. They are made of clay, sand, water, and bitumen, or whatever that's called. Crude oil can be recovered. Um, and then when we quantify energy efficiency, remember that energy transformation is going to require energy to be lost at every step, just like in food chains. Uh, but we also need to remember the steps, right? There is an energy resource. There's going to be an extraction proce um, process, a, transform a transportation step, the processing step, and every step there is a energy needed. And maybe I can ask you a question, right? Put the timeline in order of, you know, um, the formation or the process or the production, sorry, of energy. Okay, so... This was a type of question, um, has been a type of question in the past on, a, on an exam. So we have an example of the types of energy for that burning ethanol um, and the energy, what is it? Sorry, let me go back. The, whoa, I went to back. The energy return on investment. So we're going to talk again, link it to energy return on investment. Here we go. So they're going to tell you a question, something like uh, whatever type of energy source, right? We're going to look at the energy um, return on investment. So for example, here, if we want to talk about ethanol, so what is the energy return on investment for ethanol? Well, you're going to say for growing that, you're going to need this or you're going to need this amount of energy. For converting that corn and distributing, you're going to need to input that, right? That's an expense. That's something you need to spend. So that's the input. And then we have uh, burning ethanol as fuel in a car. That's the output. The pure, well, the pure carbon dioxide byproduct that's sold, you can also uh, count that as the output. And then simple calculation, they acquire over the one expense. So over here, this is the acquire, that ratio. This is divided by, that would be a 1.28. Remember on the chart that I told you that ethanol corn is like almost zero, like, oh, like one something? Well, this is this. So according to this number, can ethanol be considered a viable replace to gasoline as fuel for cars worldwide? Yes, no, and why? Right? I think the answer is obvious. So, the right energy source for the job. Consider the overall system efficiently always. Compare electric water heater and natural was a water heater. So, the tankless over here and the electric water heater. Heating hot water is 99% efficient. Tankless 80%, so why might the overall efficiency of the tank system be only 35? Why do you think that's that's the case? Um, how about if we looked at electricity from a coal fire power plant? Look how much energy mega in megajoules per passenger per kilometer travel. Right? If we use an airplane, how much energy? 
if we use a bike. If we use a car, counting all the passengers seated in the car, so like carpool, compared to a car with one driver. A car with one driver would be 3.6, right, megajoules of energy. Okay, some more dimensional analysis for you. If you were eager to practice a few more exercises and examples, very simple calculations here. I have a couple there for you. You can pause them, do, it on, do them on your own and uh, practice. Now, the fuel economy is gonna fluctuate in response to the oil price, the political issues, the regulations, right? We talked about that policies also change. The consumer demands, we have a growing population. We already talked about that. Um, the consumer demand for different types of vehicles as well. The development of new technologies and how they can be used to extract the, the energy sources. So that's gonna change again. It's gonna change. You can also look at the difference um, depending on the type of administration that we had in the past. Okay, electricity our main form of usage of energy, right? And they can be generated from different sources. Um, so they can come from a secondary source of energy, which are converted from a primary source of energy. We can look at the diagram in detail in a moment. There is an energy carrier that can move and deliver that energy in a way that can be cheaper, convenient, and usable form, right? Um, the electricity itself is clean, um, there's no pollutants to producing electricity, but the production is not. The process of making electricity is not. Now, what is an electrical grid? You need to know this. It's a network of interconnected transmission lines that connect power plants together and link them with the end users. So, for example, an electrical grid is first you have a place where electricity is generated. Again, this is where pollution happens. And then the electricity is sent to high voltage transmission lines that will be carried over those towers that you're probably seeing on your road trips into substations of lower voltage, right? They are carried in very high voltage and then they are carried into these places that are lower voltage to be distributed to residential or industrial customers or commercial customers. Okay. A combined cycle plant, combined cycle plant uh, is going to be more efficient. Combined means I can use a plan to do different things. I will explain more in a moment. Um, it's going to be more efficient because it's going to use up to 60% beside, uh, versus 35% if it's only used for electricity. So a combined cycle plant um, combusts natural gas instead of coal, and the waste heat boils water to turn the steam turbine. So the capacity is gonna be the maximum electrical output is kind of run, kind of makes its, its own run kind of things, which is a good thing. Now a typical power plant is gonna, um, was gonna probably need like 12,000 megawatts in one day, right? Uh, the capacity factor is important, which is a fraction of time of a, po a power plant operating a year. Uh, most thermal power plants have a capacity factor of 0.9 or more. Renewable like wind, for example, is only 0.25. So you also have that difference over there in the capacity factor. Nuclear and coal fire take a long time, so like up to like a full day, to get up to the full capacity. So often they're kept running at all times, therefore spending this energy. Again, you need energy to produce energy. Okay, concept, last concept of the day, cogeneration of 6.3. Cogeneration is combined heat and power. So you're producing both. You're producing heat and producing power. They are use of, a um, use of a fuel to generate electricity and produce heat. So usually any kind of energy source is going to go into a cogeneration plant and using the different machines with a generator and a gas turbine that are going to transform that energy source into power and to heat at the same time. So that's called cogeneration. The last one of the day is called distribution of natural energy resources. <clears throat> so one, um, one goal on this one, global distribution of natural energy resources such as ores, right, minerals, and fossil fuels is not uniform. It's not the same. It depends on the region's geologic history. So at some point, other regions were richer in a specific type of ore. Now they are not, right? It changes over time. Okay, 
So for example, crude oil and natural gas pool, it has changed because it gets extracted and it gets depleted at that place and it, they have to move somewhere else. There is a very long video, unless you really want to, you're welcome to watch it. Um, this video talks about Cuba and what, how did they survive a time in which oil was very expensive. Anyway, um, formation. So you have the shell at the bottom. The shell at the bottom is gonna form the sandstone layer. And on top of the sandstone layer, this is where oil forms, okay? So that oil has to have that shell as, as a base kind of thing. Gas always forms on top of oil, okay? And then you have the wells that will extract those fossil fuels from there, okay? In, in detail, here we go. These are the steps over here. Now, um, there is also heavy oils and oil shell, um, oh, heavy oils from oil shell and oil sand. And what are the advantages and disadvantages of each one? Okay, so an oil shell, again, over here, oil shell, okay, oil sand, yes. Okay, good. Uh, one more thing from this one. Uh, what is it here? The oil shell definition, right? Oily rocks that contain a solid mix of hydrocarbons. So if you're not familiar with the word, important. Okay, so let's go to facts. Energy production is 80% right now fossil fuels or coming from fossil fuels. Half of that is produced by three countries, China, the United States, and the Arab states in the Persian Gulf. So the Gulf states in Norway export most of their production from the European or to the European Union and Japan because they don't have enough and they need, so they, they are demanding that amount of energy. So energy production increases slowly, except for solar and wind, which grows more than 20% a year. Now that supply chain between production and final consumption is gonna involve many conversion, again, energy transformation, right? And a lot of trade and transport between the countries, uh, which is gonna make about one third of that energy to get lost before it actually gets consumed. So if we look at here, right? We have a certain demand, and then we're gonna have these primary energy sources. There's gonna be loss because they have to carry that energy into somewhere else in order to make it all the way to the end users. So about one third of that energy that was produced actually gets to the end users. So the trend is that from 2015 to 17, worldwide production increased 2%, mainly Russia was 7%, Middle East eight, India five, China three, European Union two, in, in 2018, the world energy increased 3%. Look at USA, mainly USA was 8%. And from 15 to 17, when energy increased 37% and solar 73%. Okay, two more slides, just two maps, very simple. Um, this actually comes from Wikipedia, if you are interested in reading the details, but it just shows the main places where you have the different types of ores distributed in the world. So different places are going to have different types of ores and they again change uh, with the geologic history of the place. Uh, some additional ore deposits, right? If you want to look at specific gold mines, like some gold where Mexico has a lot of gold over here, other places with other metals. Um, and then this last one, the distribution, I'm going to watch it with you it's like a minute or less, 30 seconds. And even though it says it's for children, just so you looked at the distribution of the different ores, even though it's for children. Let's see if it plays. Uh, maybe it does not. So anyway, you will have to watch it on your own, I guess. Uh, so it's just a minute again. Uh, have a good one. I'll see you on Tuesday.